Stanford University. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And uh, I think my mission tonight is to take you on a tour through cardiovascular imaging. Uh, I expanded a little bit on the title that I was initially given because some people call some of the t acquisitions 7D imaging, and we'll talk about that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I do want to say I wear two hats, so both imaging, but I'm involved in preventive cardiology, and that theme will come up a, a little bit as we go along. Um, we, as part of full disclosure, we do get some research equipment support from GE Healthcare, part of our imaging research, and I'm on an advisory board for uh, COA, Inc. So ideally, uh, people might recognize these <laughs> pictures. Uh, we'd like to sit down on a table and look up at the screen. I could never tell what they were really looking at. But, uh, you know, Jim, we see a 70% stenosis in your coronary artery, plus there are two inflamed plaques that are about to burst. And then the magic, uh, this should clear things up for now, while we reconfigure your replicator diet and increase your exercise regimen. <laughs> and probably decrease some of other James Kirk's uh, not so great activities. Anyway, um, so I thought for tonight's uh, curriculum, we would talk a little bit about what are we trying to see when we're imaging the cardiovascular system. Obviously, the heart has muscle, valves, uh, blood vessels, we heard talk about aortic aneurysms. I, I didn't put much of that in here because of the, uh, that that was covered before, but uh, <clears throat> I'll briefly introduce some of the different imaging tools we have. Obviously, each one of these topics we could go into more depth, and I'd be happy to answer questions at the session later. Uh, and then what do this, these terms 2D, 3D, 4D, 7D actually mean? adding dimensions that incorporate function, flow, uh, and, and other parameters that we're interested in detecting or evaluating. And then I would, because part of the talk will seem fairly scattered of showing lots of different examples, I would like to try at least pick one thing that we do a little bit more in depth than something near and dear to my heart, which is coronary artery disease and talk about how we image that uh, so, and just some simple pictures or schematics of the heart. Um, so what are we looking for? We're looking for a basic structure and anatomy. We try and see, does the heart, does this heart have four chambers? Are the chambers connected correctly? As you certainly probably have heard and we'll hear further with congenital heart disease, we can't always uh, assume that the connections are correct. Uh, we deal a lot with the valves that become leaky or narrowed, so we have four valves here that separate the different heart chambers to make sure that the blood is continually going in the correct direction. Um, uh, we spend a lot of time looking at the heart muscle. The fundamental aspect of the heart is it's a pump to try to make sure blood keeps circulating to keep all the other organs alive. So we do focus a lot on how well it's squeezing. Is there evidence of injury or damage to the heart muscle? Uh, and then a lot of my interest is around the vessels. A lot of cardiovascular disease starts with disease in the vessels, which ultimately affects the heart. And have the vessels become narrowed? Do they have plaque buildup in them? Is there inflammation within the wall of the vessel? So just to touch briefly on the different imaging tests. So an echocardiogram is our kind of fancy word for an ultrasound of the heart. Um, it's probably the safest, uh, most non-invasive method we have. There's no known significant risk as long as you stay within not doing super high-powered uh, ultrasound. There's no radiation involved. Um, and it relies simply on sending out sound waves or ultrasound waves, and then when they bounce off tissue, we wait to see how long it takes to come back. The longer it takes to come back, the farther away it is. Uh, and then different tissues and different tissue interfaces uh, will reflect the ultrasound differently, and that we end up putting back together to make an image. Uh, and it turns out that we can use what's called the Doppler effect. Uh, if you send out sound and it hits something moving, uh, it changes the frequency of the sound. So like when you hear the horn of a train coming towards you, 
it's higher frequency. When it's going away, it's lower frequency. So we can do the same thing when the ultrasound hits the blood and bounces back. We can check the frequency shift. If it did, then we know what the velocity of that blood is. So we can overlay uh, information about flow on top of the structure. Um, but ultrasound does require what we call an acoustic window. So ultrasound doesn't go through air. It doesn't go through bone very well. I mean, it goes through, obviously, enough that uh, you can hear me. But in terms of imaging, um, that <clears throat> much less penetration through air and bone. So we have a few spots where we can get pictures of the heart. And if one has very inflated lungs or uh, uh, narrowed rib spacing, we can end up with limited image quality. So a CT scan, that's basically taking x-ray pictures, um, but from multiple different directions. So you go into a tube, and the x-ray rotates around you. Um, and then x-rays are attenuated by hard structures. So bone is probably the classic. If you think of a chest x-ray, it mostly shows um, all the ribs and your sternum. Uh, and all these rotated different x-ray pictures are mathematically reconstructed to give you a three-dimensional image where the main tissue contrast is really how hard things are. So bone and calcium show up a lot. The advantages, it's very, very fast. Um, and it's quite a robust um, you know, uh, technique. So it's not uh, overly complex in terms of the user side of things. And so it really is the mainstay of ER care. It can be done very rapidly um, to get to a diagnosis quickly. And it's also very high resolution, so you can get down to under a millimeter, close to half a millimeter spatial resolution if needed. The dis main disadvantage is that it involves x-rays, so there is radiation. Newer techniques are using lower doses, but uh, we tried, you know, we don't know that there's some minimum radiation that's zero risk. Um, and then most of the CT scans for the heart and blood vessels, you need to give contrast to distinguish the heart muscle from the blood. Um, and the standard contrast agents can have some effect on the kidneys if you have kidney dysfunction. What about MRI? Well, it would be hard to explain this quickly, but basically it detects spinning protons, and water molecules, uh, which are abundant in the body, have a lot of protons. So most of what MRI images is uh, the water that's in your body. And depending on what tissue it is, the spinning properties, magnetic properties of those protons are a little bit different. Um, you also have protons in fat molecules. So those are the two dominant sources. MRI basically excites these little magnets, and then uh, it looks to see what the response is. And the point of the magnet is to kind of align all those protons so that when you excite it, you get enough signal to see what's going on. Uh, and then if you ever had one, they put, often put some kind of coil on to pick up the signal. So there's kind of a, there's the magnet, and then you hear all the knocking sounds while it's taking pictures, and there's a receiver coil. The biggest advantage is it has excellent tissue contrast. So it's really the dominant thing to look at your joints, your back, your head, your brain, to really sort out uh, disease from tissue. Uh, and <clears throat> it, it is high resolution. You can get down to a millimeter spatial resolution. Um, and it has the capability to go anywhere from 3D to 7D, and we'll, we'll talk about that. It does not involve what we call ionizing or kind of X-ray type radiation. There are no known long-term risks to it, um, but it is more complicated. Uh, it takes longer. It's a slower acquisition. And then some devices are not considered safe to go in the magnet. Uh, they have started to make some pacemakers that are MRI safe, but most pacemakers are not. Um, so one needs to be cogni cognizant of any metal objects or devices. And nuclear imaging, <coughs> uh, or sometimes called nuclear medicine, uh, uses a different approach. So a specific contrast agent is used, and that contrast agent is radioactive. 
Um, so, and these are specialized contrast agents that are targeted for different tissue types. Uh, and then you have a nuclear camera that basically picks up the radioactive emission or decay from that agent. So it's very, very sensitive. You can give very, very small amounts uh, of this contrast agent, and that can be detected. Uh, <clears throat> and then it's also much more biological. Um, so these contrast agents are designed to pick up inflammation, pick up um, blood flow to the heart. Uh, so they are oriented around biology and metabolism. Um, it's much lower resolution than the other techniques, and it is also slow. And then because these are radioactive contrast agents, it also involves uh, ionizing radiation. So when we talked about the 2D, 3D, all that, so basically the heart and blood vessels, they're clearly three-dimensional structures, um, but they're dynamic, so they move with time, and then they have a number of other parameters that we would like to measure that kind of add to the dimensions that we could think of. So a 2D image is kind of our usual, it's a slice of the heart, you know, and you see X and Y, kind of a fairly straightforward picture. Um, <clears throat> a 3D uh, means that you've acquired a volume of data, so you have depth information, or X, Y, and Z, so three different spatial locations. 4D typically means you've added time. So you have a 3D acquisition, but now you're acquiring it over time. So you can then <clears throat> show the dynamic changes. And certainly for the heart, the squeezing function is, occurs over time, and that's a, a critical aspect to that. Um, we've, uh, one of the engineering um, postdocs who works with me, we've looked at so-called 5D imaging. So we have a 3D volume, and we separate out the motion that's related to heart contraction from the motion of the heart that happens when you breathe in and out. So the heart sits on the diaphragm. So you can separate out the cardiac motion, respiratory motion, and then also the, the 3D aspect of the heart. So 7D is the term I've seen uh, at times used for combining 3D in space, uh, so you're acquiring a 3D structure, uh, but then you also have what the flow is, and the flow of any particular particle of blood or, of, or the motion of any part of the heart muscle happens in three directions, so you have a velocity in X, Y, and Z, as well as the location of the blood or the heart muscle in X, Y, and Z, and then if you acquire that over time, then you get kind of a full uh, <clears throat> seven-dimensional acquisition. Um, hopefully, I've tried to load up a bunch of examples of these, and I'm hoping my computer cooperates. It does most of the time, but I guess one of the advantages of having the session afterwards, if there's some really good video that doesn't uh, work here, then I'll try and get it running during the uh, reception afterwards so I can show anyone who has questions. And then I just put more D. Uh, Often, uh, we're very interested in trying to add other biologic or metabolic information, and whether you want to call that a dimension or multi-parametric imaging, um, but uh, certainly that's something that, that we've looked at too, um, though I probably won't spend too much time on that. Um, okay, so here's a start with the video, and let's see if my computer wakes up enough to do this. So this was, uh, this hopefully as it wakes up, will be a simple example of a stress echocardiogram. So <clears throat> uh, an echo is typically always shown with the transducer uh, location on top. And in this case, we put the transducer out near the tip of the heart. Um, and, uh, and that's why, uh, in a sense, this is upside down. So this is the main pumping chamber, the squeezing chamber of the heart, and then down here is the atrium. Okay, there goes one, there they go both. Okay, so <laughs> I've gotten through video slide number one. Okay, uh, so what we look for here is that the, the heart muscle, heart's shaped kind of like a football. I don't know if you've 
seen that on some of the other uh, talks, but we tend to think of it shaped like a football, and the walls should come together when it's pumping pretty symmetrically. So if I put my kind of finger in the middle, both walls would come in and squeeze pretty evenly towards me. Um, <clears throat> And this is at rest. And this is done after someone's been on the treadmill. Uh, and they get off, and we kept the images really quickly. And what you see, if I put my finger here, one wall keeps moving towards the finger. The other wall over here seems to be almost moving away. Um, if I let it play a little bit without my finger getting in the way. So this whole area uh, is not up here, it kind of comes in, and here it either stays there, or on some beats, it looks like it's going the wrong way. So oh, this, <coughs> before and after treadmill. yes. So this is kind of a standard, oh, standard stress test that we do. Um, what's nice about it is it's completely non-invasive, and uh, you don't even need to give any medication or an IV. So you get pictures before. And then after you're on the treadmill, um, OK, that started to play. That was a good sign. Um, so that was a standard 2D echo. Um, there has been a move to try to get, because you'd like to see all the different walls of the heart all at the same time. Um, <clears throat> and a 3D acquisition allows you to do that. Uh, so what is shown here, this is the actual 3D and it's always hard how do you display 3D because it's on a 2D screen. Uh, but one way to display it is you can then show three different orthogonal views simultaneously. So when we do these acquisitions, we can either view the 3D image um, <coughs> as a full 3D image, um, or we can look at each of the different planes uh, simultaneously. So sometimes it's actually easier visually to try and look at several different planes at the same time um, than it is to try to uh, look at, trying to make sense out of what's a, a 3D, trying to do a 2D representation of a 3D structure. Um, so this uh, is something that we had thought about doing because um, patients sometimes have abnormalities of their heart that really only are, show up um, due to changes when they breathe in and out. And uh, if we look at, <laughs> uh, I played earlier. Um, so this is kind of the same 2D echo as I showed before. Again, the transducer is at the top. Uh, which means it's seeing the tip of the heart first, so the transducer is out here. Um, and this is kind of a classic four-chamber view, so the left ventricle, the pumping chamber is here, the right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, so the standard four chambers except displayed upside down. I think for whatever reason the tradition is the adult lab displays it this way, pediatric echo lab usually displays it more anatomically correct and puts the atria on top. Um, so that just shows this is a normal heart. Uh, <clears throat> and <clears throat> this is a heart, this is the same patient uh, where um, they've developed a thickened pericardium. Um, and what I'm trying to get you to look for. So as I play this, uh, we'll stop this one, because that one was normal. Uh, sorry, it's not playing as well as I'd like. Um, <clears throat> when we do this acquisition, um, as the heartbeats go along, uh, what you may or may not notice is that the septum that splits the left and the heart, right heart um, ends up occasionally shifting back and forth a little bit. Uh, oh, here it happens to have stopped right in the moment where that happened. So uh, that is an abnormality that is important for us to detect, but sometimes it only happens pretty intermittently. It only happens when they happen to take a breath. <clears throat> and 
So what we've done in this image, if I can get this one to play, um, is we've actually taken out the cardiac contraction. So we've only, we've made an image here where we take an image from the same spot in the heart cycle, uh, so during the relaxation part of the heart, and then we play it with the change in the respiratory cycle. So instead of seeing the usual contraction over time with cardiac contraction, what we should see is only changes that happen due to respiration. So it basically freezes the heart in a normal heart, um, <clears throat> so like the one above. Here, you wouldn't really see anything happening because respiration's having no effect, and we've frozen the, the cardiac contraction. Um, but I can't seem to get that one going. So we, we kind of turned this respiratory mode, so uh, because the only change you should see on this image is what's exactly happening with respiration. Yes? Uh, do you synchronize this um, after the fact with software, or do you have a, 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 a timing of um, beats that come from the heart so you can remove the heartbeat portion? Um, so, so far, we've done this kind of retrospectively, so we collect as the, this acquisition is collecting a signal of the respiratory motion, which is this, and a signal of the cardiac motion, which is the EKG. And so right now we're retrospectively doing that, but you could build this into the system where the, the echo machine itself would, would do the, the rearranging. Um, but that hasn't been done yet. Okay, sorry, one, one, more, um, one more 3D from the echo side. Um, so this, the, the one invasive thing we do, sometimes do with echo, is uh, have the tube go down, the ultrasound probe goes down your swallowing tube because you can get very close to the heart. So this is actually an acquisition where the left atrium is here and this is the septum that separates the left and the right atrium. Um, and uh, there's a little something that was floating there. Um, it seems to have stopped floating. There it goes. Um, so that shouldn't be there. Um, so this is a blood clot uh, that had likely gotten stuck between the two chambers. There's a little hole connecting the two. So. Um, this was a nice example where the 3D shows very graphically what, uh, what this abnormality. So, um, so this would be about two centimeters, close to an inch long, which is pretty big. Anything kind of our, anything over a centimeter we think of as for a, for a mass that's not supposed to be there um, on a valve or something like that is a pretty good size. So. Um, so I'm trying to shift over to CT here. Um, so CT typically acquires a large volume um, very quickly, and then the data is then you know redisplayed or reconstructed and played in a in a movie format uh, when it wants to look at function. like it's going to be torture for everybody. Maybe I should pass my baton. Um, I don't. Yep. I'm going to try that. The other thought is I could potentially run some of these without um, 
starting the <clears throat> so um, what's done here is again a, a, a whole 3D or you could argue 4D volume so it's acquired over time um, so a 4D CT and then afterwards you can go on the computer and basically pick whatever slice or plane you want to look at so here um, are all the different kind of standard planes as well as what we call the short axis plane that's acquired. One of the things you'll notice here is the image quality kind of varies over the cardiac cycle because the radiation is only turned up during the kind of slower diastolic part of the cardiac cycle. Um, and that's in order to minimize the radiation exposure to the patient. So, um, <clears throat> so I can show the short axis here. And so you get very high resolution, very high image quality. Um, but it does uh, rely on a contrast agent uh, to have, so the blood there is bright because of the iodine and the contrast. <clears throat> so that same data set can be, we would say, windowed differently uh, so that, um, and displayed differently so that the blood now looks transparent and you see then the heart muscle here, uh, and you see the heart valves, which is here. And then this is looking at a cross-section of the aortic valve up close or zoomed in. Uh, and so normally, like on the prior one, the blood is all bright uh, uh, when you're trying to look at the heart muscle squeezing. When you want to look at the valves, it's windowed such that the, the blood is transparent, and then you can see these fine leaflets uh, of here, the aortic valve, uh, and then here, the mitral valve. I'm gonna try this again. So this is a 2D image. Uh, we've switched over to MRI. Um, so this is just a static image. It's not moving single slices that are acquired. This is an example how MRI can pick up heart muscle damage that's happened in the past. So um, <clears throat> here there's a bright signal. A uh, certain contrast agent was given here, and this bright signal indicates, and you see it here as well, um, that there was a heart attack uh, in that region in the past. Uh, and in the same patient, if you look at what their squeezing function is like, um, then uh, this is now done over time. So you get uh, uh, what should be a moving image. But I can show one of these. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely not in a good mood today. Um, I wanted to show a couple of examples of uh, nuclear imaging. So nuclear imaging is typically used for perfusion. So you give this radioactive contrast agent both uh, at rest, and then you can also give it with stress. Um, and it's taken up by the heart muscle. So the more flow to the muscle, the more it's taken up. Um, so you can see an example here. This is at rest, and this is with stress. So in this, what's called the anterior part of the heart, there's good uptake, there's less uptake in this part of the heart. Uh, and then after stress, there's even less uptake here compared to here. So that's an indication kind of like in the stress echo we were looking at, that there's impaired blood flow, typically from a blockage in a heart artery. So there are techniques to do this with CT as well. That contrast that you give to opacify the blood, it does make the heart muscle brighter. And you can look at if <clears throat> here the heart muscle similarly is brighter. Uh, you see the most signal here was somewhat less here, but then there's even worse signal indicated by the darker color. 
So um, while nuclear has been the standard way to do this, there are efforts to try and do this by CT as well. And then we didn't talk about kind of multimodality imaging. So uh, a number of the nuclear medicine scanners have been combined with CAT scans. So in the same scanner, you can get, this is a 3D perfusion representation um, with a CAT scan of the coronary arteries. So if you look here, uh, pretty good perfusion at rest, but with stress, there's an area of hypoperfusion. I wanted to show one example of this, uh, or some examples of blood vessels. Uh, and where this rotates around. So this is a 3D MRI acquisition. Uh, and what you can see here, and something Dr. Feinstein knows very well, is a, a tight or narrowed aorta. Um, And let me do the 170 acquisition. <clears throat> so what's acquired here is a three-dimensional data set of the heart. Um, and then at the same time, velocity data is acquired. Uh, and that's overlaid with color. So you have, you know, for any particular part in this image, you know the x, y, z location, you know the direction of velocity in x and y, z direction, and it's imaged over time. And this really is very good at letting one see when there are abnormal connections and abnormal flow patterns uh, in the heart. So uh, I think I'm using up my time, so I'm going to just talk briefly about coronary disease, um, uh, which builds up over time. And most of us in the room have some degree of plaque buildup. Uh, most heart attacks, though, are, happen in patients with risk factors. So it's not something that strikes people completely out of the blue, usually. So you need to pay attention to your risk factors and try and minimize those and have them treated. In the United States, actually very few, only less than 10% of the population is considered at low risk. Um, and actually that's been getting worse, not better, because of probably obesity and diabetes as the major contributors. And so it remains this plaque buildup in the arteries as the number one cause of disease. Unfortunately, while I showed stress tests and other methods, a lot of patients still get an invasive angiogram um, and only if, if you're going for non-emergent reasons, less than half of the patients when this large series was looked at ended up having a true blockage. So the message to me is we're not, maybe we're doing too many angiograms, but also we're not doing a good enough job on the non-invasive side to give doctors techniques to find coronary disease. So one hope has been that CT angiograms would be a way to do this. Um, so you get a CAT scan with the dye, but uh, there's no catheter that goes into the heart. And here you can see a nice narrowing. Um, <clears throat> these can be done at much lower radiation these days. So this is uh, Dominic Fleischmann, who's in radiology here. So three millisieverts is, is actually our annual exposure living on Earth. We get about three millisieverts every year. So this CAT scan is done with that amount of radiation. So, uh, compare that for people with a chest X-ray. A chest X-ray is several hundred fold lower. Uh, so a chest X-ray is very very low. Um, but uh, so a chest X-ray I think is a like a tenth of a millisievert. It's quite low. Um, but uh, the original CTs of the coronaries uh, were about twenty millisieverts. So, so it was much higher. So. The techniques of getting it down to kind of the same amount you get in your annual exposure is a clear improvement. Um, <clears throat> one can do angiograms by MRI. Um, and uh, we have engineering students who are working on 
letting people breathe during the procedure and then correcting all that motion afterwards so that you can go from fuzzy pictures to nice pictures of your heart arteries as you see here. Um, groups at UCSF have also done these 3D acquisitions which you can display either kind of on a flat line or as a, a three-dimensional structure. And CT has been doing somewhat better than MRI when compared head-to-head. -head. They're close. Um, um, and I'll kind of skip through this just to show that there is a big uh, multi-center trial going on in the United States, and, and we're one of the sites trying to compare the stress testing like you saw before with the CAT scan angiography to see which is a better way to manage patients non-invasively. Uh, and the hope that maybe it would be better at detecting disease with the CAT scan and maybe fewer patients would go for invasive angiography who don't, you know, end up not having a blockage. Yes? Is it true, the statement, as I understand it, folks, if you get a CT and it finds anything, they're going to have to do the um, angiogram anyway? Um, so uh, if a CT finds a severe blockage, then a common treatment uh, is to go in and put in a balloon or a stent. And so then, yes, you would have to get another angiogram. Um, <clears throat> the data, though, we're struggling with is a lot of patients are going to the invasive angiogram who turn out not to have blockages. So one of the purposes of this trial is to see if you get the CT, maybe people seeing all these plaques will send more people to ang angiograms, invasive angiograms, which is not what we'd like. But uh, this is one of those rare trials where patients are very simply going to get one test or the other, and then they're followed to see actually how they do clinically. So we're, we're kind of trying to do a real-world comparison of what the downstream effect of doing this imaging test is. Um, so the last couple of slides are just saying the final frontier that we'd like and we put a lot of effort into is can we image the plaque biology? I mean, this is where the disease starts, right? So um, we'd like to be able to see it at early stages and then be able to treat it to prevent getting blockages. Um, so we've done some animal models of that. I won't go into details on that. I'll probably just go right to one of the fellows who's here when he was at Mass General worked on combining PET, which is one of the nuclear medicine techniques, with CT. And this is a PET agent that uh, is an analog of glucose. So where there's very metabolically active tissue, it shows up as bright. Uh, <clears throat> and they found in patients who came into the hospital with, with new or worsening chest pain that they had a lot more uptake of this glucose signal in their heart arteries. So this may be a way to combine kind of that first slide of seeing both blockages and then which ones are more biologically active or inflamed. Just wanted to thank a lot of collaborators. And if this plays, well, it plays. This is actually from the anatomy department. And they have um, made a virtual dissection table to try and teach all this to the medical students. So you can actually cut away the body and then you'll see you can rotate. Uh, so the heart area is here, and you can see all the organs inside. Uh, or you can go back and select that you want to just see all the arteries and veins, and those all get displayed very nicely. And then you could rotate and, and look through. What they're working on trying to do is obviously the heart is missing here. Uh, so, but they're trying to integrate uh, pictures like this into that that have the full kind of 4D and volume flow, uh, volume uh, information. So I think this era of having all this kind of information more at your fingertips is coming. Between Mike and I, it appears that we are glorious overachievers since neither of us can actually get our movies to work. So, <laughs> so Mike started his uh, talk with uh, a disclosure, and I, and I give a disclosure of a different kind. So this says, for those of you in the back, we now turn to an expert on the subject who doesn't actually know anything more than we do, but looks sincere, sounds convincing, and has doctor in front of his name. <laughs> so Mike, uh, 
gave a wonderful introduction actually to my talk, and since I was fairly confident he was going to talk about all of the imaging modalities that go into what I do, I've essentially skipped all of that. He also gave a beautiful introduction to actually one of the lesions I'm going to talk about, so thank you for doing that. So congenital heart disease uh, is the most common form of birth defect. It affects about one out of every hundred children born. It's the leading cause of death in infants, and from a numbers perspective, the cost for inpatient surgery alone to repair congenital heart disease is about $2.2 billion a year. Interestingly, this doesn't stack up nearly well enough for most of the companies out there to actually create tools, techniques, devices for pediatrics alone, because the market, if you look at the adult world, is 10 to 100 times this. So if we look at sort of the traditional methods of investigation and innovation in, in our world of medicine, you can start from the smallest cell-based investigations. You can use small or large animal subjects. You can use human subjects, and whether it's a, an observational or retrospective looking backward type of study or a prospective study coming up with an idea, looking how it plays out going forward. A lot of the stuff that we do in medicine, as scary as it may seem, is basically built on the build and test model. A surgeon, for example, comes up with a great new idea. And what's he decide to do? He decides to try it. And he may do one, he may do 10, he may do 100. And then at some point, they look back and see sort of how this has been working. And that doesn't always happen that way. But I can tell you for sure, in the world of congenital heart disease, where patients with exactly the same problem are few and far between, it's actually not uncommon at all. And most of the very common and oft-performed surgeries that we do started in exactly this fashion. Somebody came up with an idea of how to do something. They tried it. It worked or it didn't work. And they modified it. And they just kept going forward with that idea. And then in general, they look back 5, 10, 20 years later, and they get a report on how things worked out. From an emerging perspective, I think we're obviously in a very different world today than we were even 5, 10, or 20 years ago. We're now into the world of omics, whether it's genomics or proteomics. And I'm sure most of you have heard uh, information on this. We're now in the world of bioinformatics. Uh, and now, more and more, we're going into the world of simulation. And I'm not going to talk about simulation in the adult world, but a lot of what Mike talked about is actually incredibly important <coughs> as it relates to starting to perform some of these virtual types of cardiac catheterization using some of the imaging techniques that Mike talked about and a lot of the research in areas that Mike is working in. We now have the ability to do simulations of caths and then see if, in fact, those patients need treatment. So one step beyond just doing the imaging. So the simplest question that I will answer tonight is why simulate? And it doesn't matter whether you're simulating congenital heart disease or you're simulating anything else. That most of the time, it's done for cost savings or time savings. Certainly in our world, it's nice to do it because you can look at what-if scenarios. You don't have to take a patient to the operating room. You can simulate it, save that patient from the surgery, go back, try something different, and then take the patient as you figure it out. The, slide, the figure on the right is very telling. And, and the key is, is that the cost of doing, uh, the cost of an error when you're in sort of the analysis stage is very, very low. Once you've gotten all the way to design, build, and test, whether you're in any company or in medicine, the cost is much, much higher. So the key is to catch the errors very, very early on. And that's what simulation affords you. So good news, bad news. Good news. Computer models of nuclear reactions and atomic or hydrogen bombs are sufficiently accurate so that such bombs can be usefully tested via computer simulations. I think everybody here would prefer we do simulations of nuclear bombs than actually trying to test it. More good news. The actual physical models of the Boeing 777 were never built or tested. The entire plane was designed and built using computer simulation before they ever started putting the machine together. Here, for example, just as a sort of a sublime to the ridiculous, this is the impact that the landing gear of a 777 would have on the concrete at an airport. So this is the kind of level of sophistication and simulation they're doing in other areas, classical engineering areas. Bad news. A single-celled animal is more complex than the 777. <laughs> so now you know what we're up against when we try to think about simulating the human body or hum simulating a cell or simulating congenital heart disease. So what are the different types of areas that we can use simulation to help us? Clearly, we can use it to further understanding of a process or a parameter that, that we just simply have no other techniques to measure. For example, how can we prove that a stent is better than surgery? Well, we could do thousands and thousands of stents and thousands and thousands of surgeries and then wait 20 years or 30 years or 50 years and see how they did. Or we could simply do a simulation and see how they hold up. 
for very, very specific questions, obviously. It can help us answer why a particular blood vessel, when there's a pacemaker lead sitting in it, tends to clot in certain areas. We know it does it. We have a hunch as to why it does it. Well, is there a way that we can prove why it does it and then look to invent a better lead or a better way of placing that pacemaker lead? And last but not least, we can look at whether biomechanical forces lead to disease or lead to disease progression. Again, using these techniques, we can make measurements that you can't make any other way. We can also use it as a tool for the design of new devices, whether they're stents or closure devices, or for new procedures, either in the cath lab or in the operating room. And finally, we can use it to design the best surgery for a particular patient. Everybody's heard the term personalized medicine. Well, it turns out that we're just starting to get there in my world, but we're not quite there yet. I give you these particular uses for simulation because I'm going to talk about each one. There are obviously other uses as well. So the general simulation process starts with imaging, whether it's echo in some cases or CT or MR, as, as, Mark, as Mike has talked about beautifully. Then you take that and you actually build a model. And the model can be one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional. But you have to remember there are costs associated with whatever you want to build. Obviously, building a one-dimensional model and trying to run a simulation on it much, much cheaper, both in time and energy, than trying to do something in three dimensions. Then you start to add pieces to the model to get the simulation to be more and more accurate. You have to tell it what the blood flow looks like, for example, coming into the area that you're interested in. And you have to talk about what it's like for the blood to try and get out of those areas. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more. Then you run the simulation. You analyze it. And then if you're very, very lucky, quite frankly, and have good colleagues who want to do some of this with you, then you try to validate what you actually did. Far too many simulations are given as what I'll call homework problems. They're interesting, they're done, and nothing else happens. We're very lucky here in that we have surgeons who are willing to work with us, try and prove or disprove what we actually believe happens, and then you go back to the drawing board and try and figure out what went wrong and what went right. So back in the dark ages, when this field of simulation in congenital heart disease started, when life and models were simple, this is all the way back in 1996. That's when, the, that's when this field started. So it turns out, in fact, that I was still in my training when this field started. So I have ridden the appropriate wave. So what did they do? They looked at 30 measurements from angiograms. And down on the bottom of the screen here, this is an angiogram. So you can see how very, very accurate you can imagine that it must be. So they take 30 measurements, almost like looking at an x-ray, basically. You look at one view. You look at another view. You take a bunch of measurements. You put them together. And you build a model. And this is what the model looks like. They use, in order to build your model, you have to have a bunch of elements, or what are called nodes, or parts of a mesh. And in this particular case, back in 96, they used between 15,000 and 33,000 nodes. For those of you who've worked in the, the PC and or programming world, they're running Fortran, which thank God is almost gone. They're running it on a, an IBM PC, basically, at 33 megahertz with 32 megs of RAM. For those of you who are wondering, and wandering around with these in your pocket, these are running at 800 megahertz. Okay, so think about running at 30 megahertz. Okay, so how do we do it now? We are, I must admit, a little bit further along than what that was. Now we do the imaging, we do the model building, which takes basically four steps, which I'm going to show you in a second. We then do the simulation, the analysis, and then hopefully iterate. So, for example, this is the process side by side. So back in '96, they're doing 15 to 30,000 elements we're running between 500,000 and 2 million elements, okay? Processor speed is 32 megahertz back then. It's 3.2 gigahertz now, so a hundredfold difference. Plus, don't forget cloud computing and cluster computing, so we're running 7, 8, 10 computers all simultaneously. The memory was 32 megs back then. It's 32 gigs, again, multiplied by however many computers you want. Simulation time was days to weeks. Now it's hours to weeks. But here's the kicker, right? Can we do this in real time yet? And the answer is no. We still can't do it in real time, despite this incredible increase in computing power. And there's two reasons for that. The biggest reason is that it takes us a long time to build the models. We don't actually have automated processes to take imaging data and go straight to a model. Still done predominantly by hand. We're getting much, much better, and there are steps that are now done in an automated fashion. But it still takes a tremendous amount of time to take a huge, huge imaging data set and convert it into something we can use. So I'm going to show you a couple quick examples. Here's the first one, whether a stent is better than surgery. So thank you, Mike, for the introduction. So the picture that Mike showed before of that narrowing or blockage in the aorta is called coarctation of the aorta. It's a fairly common congenital heart disease. 
happens about 5 to 10 percent of all congenital heart disease. And even when you fix it, the outcomes are not optimal. And it's because we believe there's a vasculopathy or a problem with the vessels themselves that prevents them from actually leading a normal, healthy life. So here's the coarctation in its drawing form. This is what Mike showed you in the MRI. And so there are two ways to treat this. You can treat this with surgery, which uh, I'd like to simplify since I don't do it. You basically cut out the bed part, stick them back together, and you're good as new, okay? <laughs> Surgeons will tell you it's a little harder than that, but it seems, <laughs> seems pretty easy to me. In the world of the cath lab, we use stents, which I must admit to a surgeon's eye is probably no more difficult. You run a catheter in there, you run it with a stent, which is a stiff mesh metal tube. You blow up a balloon, the stent expands, you take the balloon out, you go home. I must admit, sounds fairly easily as well. So surgeons have always yelled, stents are terrible. They're stiff, they're not like a normal vessel. It must be horrible, horrible to have one of those in there. Don't do it, go with surgery, okay? Let's just say, as an interventionalist, I disagreed with that, and now I have proof, okay? So we said, basically, how stiff is a stent? How much does it actually impact the heart? And does it make a difference? So here's the process. Here's the model, model building process, as I mentioned. You take imaging, and this looks very similar to the one that Mike was nice enough to show. You then trace the vessel, and that's what these lines are. This is the vessel itself. These are the vessels going to the head. These are the vessels that have developed as a way that the body tries to bypass the blockage. They're called collaterals. Then you look at each individual slice and you trace the vessel itself. That's what this number three is showing. I don't know why my mouse is not showing up. Then this is one of the parts that we've automated. You loft or you create a three-dimensional surface from all those circles and all of those lines. And then you can actually create the model from it. So you go from an MR image to a three-dimensional model such as this one. Okay. For the engineers, I threw this in there because I thought you'd like to see something familiar. So a bunch of resistors, a bunch of capacitors. And the answer is you at some point have to tell the model what it's working up against, right? What happens to the blood when it tries to leave? What are the forces working against it? What are the resistors working against it? And in a similar fashion, you have to tell the model what's coming into it. What does the blood flow look like? Is there a lot of blood flow? Is there a little blood flow? Does it look normal? Is the heart functioning normally? You have to input all of these parameters. And for quite a long time, we didn't actually know how to do <coughs> most of this. Okay? So now we're starting to actually simulate the function of the heart at the same time. So here's the results when you take a normal. So there's a normal aorta sitting over on the side. And here's what we can actually get. And for any of you who've seen a blood pressure tracing or seen one on TV, it looks very similar to what you're used to seeing. Right? There's a systolic blood pressure, a top number, and then a diastolic blood pressure. And this is all simulated. None of this is actually measured. The other thing that we can now start to do is simulate what the actual pressure looks like as compared to the volume that surrounds, the, that, that is inside the heart. And when you talk about this, this is a pressure compared to volume or a PV loop. And if you look here and you add up all the area within that curve, it tells you how much work the heart is actually doing, okay? So if you simply apply this in our scenario, you can run simulations and then simulate the treatments. So here's the simulation of the coarctation in general. So this, on the left, we're showing pressure, okay? So at peak systole, meaning the top number when you take a blood pressure, red is high and blue is low. So very, very high pressure before the blockage, not particularly surprising, and much, much lower blood pressure after the blockage. And that's the problem with the blockage. You have to generate tremendous pressure in order to push the blood past the obstruction. We can look at things like the pressure, we can look at things like the velocity itself and look for areas of fast flow and slow flow. Turns out slow flow is not such a good thing. Slow flow sets you up for plaque deposition and other forms of atherosclerosis. So then we said, okay, let's simulate surgery versus stenting, okay? And so over here, we did the surgery that's pictured on the left. So what we've done is we've cut out the bad piece and pulled the descending aorta up to the ascending aorta, the top part of the aorta. And over here, we've implanted a virtual stent. And what we did was we just assigned relative values of stiffness to the various pieces of the puzzle, okay? This we can measure, right, by MRI. As Mike was talking about, you can measure motion, you can measure how it responds to a pressure. So you can measure this and you can measure this. And then what we said is, well, let's just use the worst case scenario. Let's say that a stent is an order of magnitudes 10 times worse than what the actual tissue looks like. What does it look like if that's in fact what you do. And here's the results. 
Long story short, you can't see a difference between the two curves. You can't see a difference between the blood pressure that's generated by the repair, and you can't see a difference in the work that's generated by the repair. And it turns out that if any of the surgeons were actually engineers, this would make perfect sense. Turns out, if you do some back of the envelope calculations, it takes a stent about nine feet long to actually make an impact on the heart. Now, the likelihood is we're not gonna be implanting nine foot long stents anytime soon. <laughs> so I would argue I've, I've proven my case against the surgeons. So here's an example of how this can be used in clinical care. So this was a case that we had in our conference one day, and it was a patient who had already had his coarctation repaired, he's 17 years old, and he had a normal resting blood pressure. But when he exercised, his blood pressure went up over 250, which is pretty high, pretty high. And this is what his anatomy looked like. So he had this sort of little narrowing here and a little bit of narrowing here, and the question came up, if we fix this, would we actually fix the problem? And so here you go. So when you look at it, here's rest, here's exercise, and here's exercise with it repaired. There's no difference at all. So technically, we saved him an operation. Okay. Why do veins clot in the area where the pacemaker lead is? Well, it certainly would make sense, and I don't think anybody in the room wouldn't guess. Well, if you have something in the way and the blood can't get past it, the blood accumulates in that area, and then you end up with a clot there. Well, it turns out that's exactly right. And this is simply proving that that is exactly right. So the same general concept of building a model. So top left corner, same basic concept. Take images, you add the pacemaker leads in the vessels, you build your simulation, you build your model, and then you run your simulation. And even for people who don't know what they're looking at, I will simply tell you that in the top panel, when you're looking at velocity or speed, blue is bad. So you can see when you start to add pacemaker leads, which are these white circles here, you start to see a lot more blue, and the blue tends to collect around the pacemaker leads. <coughs> And when you look down here, this is called mean exposure time or resonance time or the amount of time a particular cell or platelet hangs out in a particular area. Red is bad, it means higher time. And again, once you start to put the leads in, you'll see that the areas around the pacemaker leads have a lot of resonance time. Well, I would argue that this is not exactly rocket science. It's not particularly hard to think. It's not particularly hard to believe. But the difference is now that you can prove this and you can use simulation to do this, now you can develop new pacemaker leads and see if the same thing happens. You can develop new ways of moving the leads and holding them in different places to see if, in fact, that reduces the amount of resonance time or slow flow. And you can start to actually improve on how often the blood vessels get blocked. In adults, it's not as much of a problem, right, because the vessels are big and the pacemaker leads are small. In kids, it's a much, much bigger problem. You put a pacemaker lead in, you start to block off a vessel, you have no way of replacing those leads later on in life. And last but not least, looking at biomechanical forces leading to disease, okay? So if you look at the, the aorta, if you look at the areas that have very, very slow flow, those are the areas that tend to gain plaque, okay? Plaque is bad. Plaque, plaque makes your vessels more diseased. They obviously have a lot of other issues associated with them. Mike talked about plaque in the coronaries. Turns out that that's one of the reasons that exercise is so great, because it increases the speed of the blood going by. It increases what's known as shear stress. The shear stress tells the cells to excrete more positive things that are better for the vessel's health. Slow flow is bad, fast flow is good. So looking at this particular case, which is the case of pulmonary hypertension or high blood pressure in the lungs, turns out there's no cure right now. So one of the things we're trying to do is to figure out how we can actually slow the process. So if you look at just these two pictures, and I tell you that the two on top are normal and the two on the bottom have pH, Again, you don't have to do this for a living to notice there's a difference, right? And so the red is faster flow or higher shear, and the blue is lower flow or lower shear. And we know that low shear leads to expression of many, many abnormal and deleterious factors. Proteins, genes are all expressed based on shear. And so now we've taken this actually from the simulation world into the cell world, okay? So rather than going from cell to bigger, we're going from simulation down to cell to prove what we think is right. So how can we design new, new tests and new procedures? So the Fontan operation is an operation performed for kids who only have one pumping chamber. And again, as Mike alluded to, when they're looking for, for function or structure of the heart, you hope to find all four chambers. In some of our kids, that's not true. In some of them, they only have one functional pumping chamber. And so to work around that, what we do is a series of operations 
first by t taking the supravena cava or one of the veins coming back to the heart and plugging it directly into the pulmonary arteries to take the blue blood to the lungs to get oxygen. A few years later, we then take the blue blood from the bottom half of the body or the inferior vena cava and we connect that up as well. And once all of this is done, this T-shaped connection, that's called the fontan. Right, so here's the final connection. That's the fontan. So if you remember very early on, going way back to 96, that was a fontan that I was showing you. That was the original operation that they started to look to try to understand. And so many people, us included, have started to look at trying to improve this efficiency. The blood goes to the lungs by passive flow, right? There's no pump anymore. So you would think, common sense would dictate, better efficiency is better overall. Turns out, long story short, efficiency is not probably the most important thing. But here's something we did. So we looked at a couple of different options. And we ended up looking at something called a bifurcated or a Y version of the Fontan. So instead of this T-shape, now we have a bifurcated version below. And one of the reasons we did this is to stop the collision of the blood flow coming from above with that coming from below. A group in Atlanta came up with this that they codenamed OptiFlow. Long story short, you can't actually build OptiFlow. It's actually impossible to do this for many different reasons. And this has never seen the light of day. The y graft, on the other hand, has actually now seen the light of day both in our institution and in Atlanta. Well, that's not good. <laughs> there we go. And so looking at the y graft and a lot of different simulation methods, you can look at a number of different things again. You can look at pressure. You can look at how efficient any particular model is. And you can look at blood flow distribution, which it turns out is also important in our world. So much to my chagrin. So my wife said, what are you talking about? And I said, oh, my simulation work. And she said, knowing my pension for not doing this, you going to put any movies in? I said, no, I can't do it. Because every time you go to do a presentation, something happens to your movies. Right? <laughs> so I've gotten completely away from putting movies into any of my talks, as Mike has learned. <laughs> and my wife, bless her soul, said, you can't. It's simulation. The movies are really cool. This is what they're coming to see. They, they don't really care about still frames. You've got to show movies. <laughs> right? There you go. So I inserted the really cool movies. And as expected, they don't work. <laughs> so the good news is I can actually get mine to work this way, I hope. So here, for example, is a simulation of the velocity in one of the Y graphs. Right? So this is actually a simulation of a patient where the top half is their anatomy and the bottom half is what we've constructed as what we think is correct. And the red is, is velocity, is faster velocity than the blue. Okay? And you can simply, for the, for the sake of comparison, compare this to the other version of the Fontan, which is the one that I showed you earlier. Okay, so here's the other version, the T-shaped version. And you can see, obviously, the flow patterns are very different. There's a different kind of collision. There's a different kind of distribution. Um, and you can obviously get a lot of information out of these types of movies. You can also look at how blood flow is di distributed. Okay, so this is what's known as particle tracking. Okay, and so the blue are the blood vessels that are destined for the right lung. Everything is backwards. So this is the right side and this is the left side. So the blue particles are the ones destined for the right lung, and the red particles are the ones destined for the left lung. And if you look at sort of qualitatively, what you notice is more of the particles go to the left than go to the right. And that's not surprising if you looked at this baffle or graft aims toward the left lung. Right? If you then look at the Y graft, you'll see that things are a little bit better distributed. Okay? And that's one of the reasons that we think it's important to do the Y graph. Okay? One of the things you'll also notice, however, is that very little flow actually ends up getting up and into this guy, which is the right upper lobe. Turns out that the hepatic factor, or the blood flow coming out of the liver, is important to try to distribute evenly. And that's why we believe the Y graft is important. However, with this new technique, we may not be getting enough of that flow to the right upper lobe. We don't know. But that's one of the nice things about simulation. So just to prove that this never makes any sense, that didn't work, that didn't work. And yet, this one does. Right? Go figure. So the, the reason I put this one in is to simply show that a lot of the techniques that we're learning don't have to just be applied to congenital heart disease. So this is the same particle tracking or looking at where the blood is going in a model of a coronary artery. Okay. 
So it's important to suddenly start to realize that one size and one design and one shape does not fit all. These are six different patients. These are actual imaging data sets of six patients. And if you look at the beautiful Fontan that we drew and you look at reality, they're not even close to the same. So the question is, how do you plan to do the same operation every time on patients who look this diverse? And the answer is you can't possibly expect to do that. And that's, again, where simulation can come in. The other thing you have to do is figure out which parameter or which item is actually the one you care about. Do you care about the pressure in the system? Do you care about the flow distribution? Do you care about the shear? You have to figure that out. And until very recently, we've all focused just on the efficiency. And it turns out that's probably not the right thing to do. So with this in mind, how do you design the best surgery for a particular patient? So here's the Glen, right? So there's five different patients here with a Glen shown down on the left. The Glen is the second stage or the stage where just the upper body is. And then you have all of these different options on how to do the final surgery, the Fontan. So you run simulations using all of these different parameters, and then you pick, you literally pick what you think is the most important. Is it flow distribution? Is it pressure? Is it wall shear stress? Is it twice the value of the wall shear stress plus four times the value of the flow distribution? We don't know, to be perfectly honest with you. But at some point, you have to make some version of an arbitrary decision and then go back and see if you were right. So in these particular cases, when we do all the simulations and we pick the ones that we think are best, this is what we end up choosing for these individual patients. So then you have to actually validate. If you're very, very lucky, you get to do the validation. And so we just completed the, the first pilot trial using the new Y-graft here at Stanford. And this trial was designed to basically test technical feasibility because many of the surgeons that were out there said, you can't do it, it's too hard. Fortunately for us, our surgeons didn't say that, and they were willing to try it. The only exclusion from this, we took any patient who walked in the door that was going to a particular surgeon, the only exclusion criteria was a history of a problem clotting. And the reason we were worried about clotting was because the grafts or the tubes we were going to use were smaller than the ones that we normally used. Because if you think about it, if you're using two of them for the bifurcation or the legs, you don't need them to be as large as the one tube that normally supplies all of the blood flow. They did everything the same way they normally did. All the medications were the same. All the post-op care was the same. And then what we did was we looked by MRI to see how things looked. At the end of the day, we were just trying to make sure that we could actually get these things implanted. And then we were looking to see what they looked like. So we tried it in seven patients. Six received the Y-graft. In one, it was technically not feasible because there were some other vessels in the way. The grafts were made out of Gore-Tex. And this is a picture of one of our surgeons, Dr. Reddy, actually sewing the pieces of the graft together. There are off the shelf or readily ordered Y graphs, but from our perspective, they didn't actually meet the measurement specifications that we wanted. All the procedures were successful and there were no procedural complications, except. So here's three out of the first five sitting over here and you can see the nice bifurcation here. These are MRI images, by the way. Another beautiful bifurcation, another beautiful bifurcation, and then there's something missing, right? So this is patient number six. This is the patient that developed a clot in one of their legs, okay? Turns out at this particular point in time, it doesn't really matter because the vessels themselves are not much bigger than the grafts we're using, but you do wonder what's gonna happen now that we have a smaller graft on one side and the other side is clotted. So now, again, in the name of validation and reiteration, we're gonna go back and simulate this patient now that we have all the information and see if there was something there that could tell us why this happened or at least help us predict that it may happen again in the future. So now we're starting to say maybe the efficiency is not so important. Maybe it's things like shear. Maybe this is the patient that had the lowest shear out of the six. And so when you put flow into this small tube with low shear, they're prone to form clot. So some closing thoughts. Failure is the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. And with the world of simulation, we are bound and happy to fail multiple, multiple times and get smarter and smarter as we go. And remember that simulation is only as good as its weakest component. So with that, I give you a little tale. So a bunch of NASA engineers who decided that they were going to build a special cannon. And what they were going to do is they were going to fire chickens at the windshields of airplanes and the space shuttle because, as you know, bird impacts are a problem. So they built the whole thing. They tested it. worked perfectly. The British heard about this, and they wanted to try it as well, but they wanted to try it on their train, right? The, the TGV in, in Paris, I don't know what it's called in, in London. 
So they did all the simulations. They did simulations from night until dark, and they were ready to go. They did the test, fired off the chicken. It shattered the windshield, destroyed the interior of the train. So they put all their stuff together. They sent all the simulation results back to the US, and they said, help us. And only one sentence came back, thaw the chicken. <laughs> You're only as good as your weakest link. <laughs> Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.